I'm Dr. Kristen R. Bromley. This Guitar 101 series, which is part of my online music academy, is a beginner through intermediate level guitar course similar to the in-person ones I teach at the university. The course progresses from complete beginner through gaining capability in playing songs in various styles and covers playing chords and melodies and reading chord symbols, tablature, and standard music notation. With the Guitar 101 course, we use three of the books from my Method Book series, Chords and Harmony Books 1 and 2, Note Reading Books 1 and 2, and Tablature, which are all available for purchase through Amazon and Google Play. Links can be found in the description below or at kristenbromley.com. You are of course welcome to participate in this course with or without the books, but with the books you can play right along with me on all the songs and exercises as intended. Plus, each book comes with exclusive access to additional hours of in-depth video lessons that go with each part of that book. If you find this Guitar 101 series helpful, please like the videos and subscribe to the channel. Alright, let's get to jamming in this week's lesson. Hi there, I'm Dr. Kristen Bromley. So delighted to have you joining me here in this Guitar 101 course. In this first lesson, we'll be starting as if you've never played the guitar before. So we're going to be covering how to hold the guitar, how to pluck and strum the strings, how to tune the strings, how to play some chords. We'll also work on playing melodies with guitar tablature and standard music notation. So it's going to be great. Let's go ahead and get started. We'll jump in with the Chords and Harmony book first. We're going to start with the introductory materials. So we'll be starting on page one. So let's go there. Okay, so here we are on pages one and two of the Chords and Harmony book. I have that indicated there on the board. So we're going to be working our way through the introduction section. Now, the introduction section for each of the three books that are used in this Guitar 101 series, they are all the same. So it doesn't matter which book you're looking at on pages one and two, it's going to be the same until we get past the introduction. So I pulled up the Chords and Harmony book because we're going to work on chords first. So it's just right there and it's the one that we're working out of. Now, as I go through the introductory materials. I'm going to go through and just highlight a few things, things that are necessary to get us playing. If you'd like more detail, and this is the case through the whole course, if there's ever a time you want more detail, each of the books come with their own lessons in addition to the Guitar 101 course. So they all have video lessons that go into greater detail than we go into in this course. So you're welcome to use those at the front of the books. You can find QR codes and addresses, web addresses, to locate those videos for each part of each of the books. So that's a great part there. But we're just going to dive in here on the introduction. So as we get started with the introduction, on page one it showing three different types of guitars, steel string, nylon string, and electric guitars. So what I'm playing here, and probably the most common type, is just a regular old steel string guitar, and maybe that's what you're playing. Nylon strings are sort of built out of the classical tradition, and classical guitars are nylon string. They're meant for finger plucking, the neck is usually a little bit thicker, the strings are made out of nylon. And then electric guitars, there's lots of different types, but they plug into an amplifier. It doesn't matter which type that you are using, you can learn on any, any of them. I'm just using a standard acoustic, it works great for teaching here in the studio with these video lessons. So, it doesn't matter which one you're on, but um, have fun learning on whichever one you're playing. So, and it, it's the same, to play on any of these guitars, they all are the same. It just may feel a little different the way it sits in your hands. Okay, so if you go ahead and flip over to page two, we'll talk briefly here about the parts of the guitar. There's a few parts of the guitar that you kind of need to know as we get started, because as I give directions, I'll be using the terms that relate to those parts of the guitar. So you have the body, the main part of the guitar, and then we have the neck, and then the headstock. And we have the little tuning keys that are on the headstock. So when we tune the guitar, the tuning keys are important. On the neck, we have what we call the fretboard. It sits there, or the fingerboard. And we've got these metal bars that run along it. These are called frets. This is important because as we push the strings down, we're pushing them against the frets. The frets are numbered from 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. It just starts at number 1, the lowest one. The space in between the metal bar and what we call the nut, the space is at fret 1, but the metal bar is, fret, is the first fret. So they're both the space where we put our finger and the metal bar are referred to as frets. So when we say fret 1, we're putting our finger in the space, we'll be putting it just a little bit behind the f actual metal fret bar, um, not clear back or in the middle, but just a little bit behind the actual bar. But the space is also referred to as fret one. And then as you go up, fret two, three, four, and then it just continues numerically all the way until you run out of frets. We also have the strings on the guitar. So the strings start numbered the top, the high string, 
is string number one. So the smallest string is string number one. The lowest string is string number six. If you by chance are playing a seven string or an eight string, then they just continue to go on seven and eight. So high is one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, that's going to be important because as we're figuring out where to put our fingers to play chords and to play notes, to play melodies, I might say second fret on the third string. You'll need to know where that third string is and where that second fret is. Okay, besides that, you have a bridge back here. The strings come through the bridge or over the bridge, over the nut, and then they, they tighten there in with the tuning keys. All right, so the next thing we're going to look at is how to hold the guitar which is over on page three, so let's go there. Okay, so here we are on page three. We're gonna talk about how we hold the guitar. I'm not gonna go into too much detail with this, but the most important thing is to sort of eliminate tension throughout the body. So if your right arm is way up in the air as you're playing the guitar, if you imagine walking around like that all day, eventually that's going to create some pain there in the shoulder and in the arm. In the left hand, if I'm bending my wrist really far backwards or forwards in some, some sort of strange, unnatural way, you walk around all day like that, you're going to get a lot of pain through the wrist and some injury potential there too. So we want to sort of be relaxed as, as much as we can and we want to be sitting comfortably or standing comfortably. When standing, you need a strap and so for most guitars that strap connects right back here. There's a pin. Mine has a pin. So back at the, the back part on the side of the guitar, the rib comes behind my back, under, under my arm, up over my shoulder. And then most guitars either connect here at the heel, just near the neck, or they come down and they tie on down by the headstock, just behind the nut. And so we stand. In both cases, the guitar is sort of situated in a similar place. When sitting, it rests on our right leg and then up over our our arm comes, our arm is going to connect, the elbow is going to be right around somewhere where the side and the top sort of meet, just in a comfortable fashion where my, my shoulder feels somewhat relaxed. The left arm comes around, the thumb is played behind the neck, and then the fingers wrap around and push the strings down against those frets. In the left hand, I want to avoid some weird sort of bending in my arm there. It should just kind of naturally come around. To get that happening when standing or sitting, it can help to have the guitar just a little bit elevated or tipped up so that your arm has room to come around. And it should feel pretty natural just the way it drops from your shoulder there in the left, left arm and then comes around to the guitar. Okay, so now we want to talk about plucking the strings and holding the pick. We'll turn over to page four. Okay, so let's talk about holding and using a pick. Now, some of my students, when they're first starting out, they prefer not to use a pick. They just like to use their thumb to strum and pluck the strings, and that's okay. And then eventually they start working on using a pick, because a lot of guitar playing is best done with a pick. Some is done with finger style. We'll talk about that into the course quite a ways when we start working with fingers, but we'll be doing everything with a pick, or if you're not ready for a pick yet, you can use that thumb in place of the pick. So when holding a pick, the pick is meant to just be an extension of the thumb. So it's just meant to sit there as an extension. So basically, to hold the pick, all you do is curl your fingers back towards the thumb, the thumb rests on the side of the index finger, and the, the pick just sort of s sits in there as an extension, you could say, to the index finger. But, real, or, but really as an extension to the side of the thumb, which would be doing the plucking if the pick wasn't there. When we strum the strings with our thumb or with the pick extended, then we're just brushing the strings. And you can just brush the strings. It's just sort of a sweeping motion. Strumming or brushing the strings is sort of the same motion as if you were waving at the guitar with your hand. So whether I'm just using my thumb, I'm using the side, if I'm using the pick, it becomes an extension held between that index finger and the thumb, just strumming those strings or brushing them. And then to pluck individual strings, just grab it, whether with the thumb or with the pick, we hold it there. Now, when I'm strumming, I usually have, oh, not quite a centimeter sticking out. You want to be careful not to have too much, otherwise you'd probably drop that pick eventually. And you don't have as much control on the sound. It's really tinny. And 
Yeah. And at any given moment, I might drop it down the sound hole, which is a, a fun game getting it back out. But I usually have about a centimeter, a little less than a centimeter when I'm strumming. Sometimes when I'm plucking notes, I go a little bit tighter and it's maybe half, half a centimeter and I have a little more control. So that's holding the pick. You get kind of used to it. When I am strumming, it's coming from the elbow with a little bit of give in the wrist. When I'm plucking the individual strings, then I'm sort of planting my wrist back here near the bridge so it sort of rests there and I have a little bit more control to pluck one note at a time. We'll see that as we work on melodies and strumming. While you're there on page four, that's where the diagram is that specifically shows where those frets are. We talked about it, but there is a diagram showing you on the guitar fret one, fret two, fret three, fret four, and so forth. And then the, the strings numbered one, two, three, four, five, and six. The strings also have pitch names, and those are written there. So the note, or the individual sound that rings out, that's what we hear when we play one at a time and those note names are there. So we have E, B, G, D, A, E. Now this is going to become important as we tune the guitar and that's what we're going to do next. Okay, so here we are on page five. We're going to talk about tuning the guitar. As you can see there, there are multiple ways that you can actually tune the guitar. The simplest way is with an electronic tuner. It's probably also the most accurate way. So that's the way I'm going to explain here just briefly. And again, if you want more information or more in-depth help with tuning the guitar, then you can check out the videos that come with these books. You can also check out our quick answer lessons, or I should say my quick answer lessons that pertain to how to tune the guitar in the various ways that are there on the page if you want more help with that. So you can buy or purchase a pretty inexpensive tuner these days. And the one I'm holding here is a clip-on tuner, so it clips on to the end. These are accurate and it doesn't get distracted um, or messed up by ambient noise. You can also download apps that are for tuning. They all work about the same way. It's not that complicated. The purpose of a tuner is to help you know if the strings are ringing sharp because they're strung too tight or flat because they're strung too loose. And so with the electronic tuner, it's going to have a meter that's going to help you know if it's ringing sharp. That'll be to the right or flat to the left. And so the zero at the top, zero cents, that's where we want our measuring line or our meter to measure straight up. And some tuners will change color, like mine turns green when it gets to that point and it's in tune. So if I hook it up to the guitar and I pluck a string and it rings sharp, it's going to be over on this side somewhere, depending on how sharp it is. If the pitch is ringing in as being sharp, it's too high, I need to loosen the string until it comes down and is in tune. If it rings in flat or too low, then I need to tighten the string until it comes up and is in tune. When my strings are too tight or too sharp, then I usually slacken them a little bit to the point of being a little bit flat and then bring it back up. Sometimes that's an easier way to get the string in tune is just bring it a little low and then bring it back up if it's too high. If it's too low, then I just bring it up and bring it into tune. So my guitar is in tune, but we're gonna play with it just a little bit here. So this, this low six string, if I tighten it, it goes higher and we can hear that. If I loosen it, it goes lower. So this is kind of backwards from righty tighty lefty loosey. It's all about the natural movement of the left hand. My natural movement in the left hand for these up on top is to actually turn to the left. And so I tighten by turning to the left and I loosen by turning to the right. But in my left hand, I'm tightening going the natural way that my left hand wants to turn and loosening by going the unnatural way. That's gonna be the case for all of the strings or all the tuning keys for the strings that are on this side of the headstock. Underneath, it still works that way, but the strings are actually, I'm actually tightening to the right and loosening to the left. So I'm still tightening the way that feels natural, but my, my wrist is flipped upside down. So I'm actually tightening to the right and loosening to the left because I'm upside down. The strings, if they're strung, properly will come the, through the inside of these posts and then wrap around. And so I tighten or I tighten to, to raise the pitch and I loosen to lower the pitch. So now that I've gone ahead and messed this up a little bit, my E string is ringing in, though you probably can't see it there, but it's ringing in a little high and so I'm just bringing it down 
<laughs> until it's into the zero. And it, it got right back in tune. This guitar's been in tune for a while, so I didn't have to lower it and bring it back up. And then my E string was also a little bit high, and I just brought it back down. So, you want to do this in gradual movements. On the electronic tuners, some of them will have an option to go chromatic. And that in that case, you really need to know what the names of the pitches are. If we've gotten out of the range of the pitch with guitar, it can be a little bit hard with a tuner to find it with the regular one on guitar setting because it's looking for that specific pitch and you may be way past it. So sometimes it may help to compare it to the piano compared to another another guitar. Or I like to use chromatic because it tells me the actual pitch that I'm ringing at. And we'll be talking about pitches later in the lesson, but if I'm supposed to have it at a B pitch and I'm ringing in on the tuner at an A that I know I'm below the B and I need to bring it up from an A to a B and then I get into where I'm actually tuning to a B so that can get a little confusing but you just want to move gradually if you string the if you take the strings and you move them too tight they can break if you loosen a string really fast and and the let off of pressure can actually cause them to break as well okay so take time you may need to pause that video and get your guitar in tune before going on I will take just a minute here and play the strings on my guitar so if you want to tune to it by ear you're welcome to do that now when tuning by ear to another instrument sometimes it can be hard to tell if what you're playing is above or below what you're tuning to. And so when it's that sort of situation for me, I usually just go loosen the string until I know I'm below what I'm tuning to and then I gradually bring it up until it's in tune. So I'll play each of these strings starting with the low sixth string. So I'll play this one for you. Okay, I'll do the A string or the 5th string. I'll do the D string or the 4th string. I'll do the third string or the G string. I'll do the B string or the second string. I'll do the E string or the top string. Of course, you can re rewind and hear those as many times as you need. You can download an app, you can buy a, an electronic tuner. The one that I used here in the demonstration, this little Fender FT004. I love these, they're really inexpensive and they work well. You can find a link for these on Amazon in the description below. Okay, so we're going to skip page six, which has some general maintenance tips. If you want to learn more about the maintenance of a guitar and keeping it in good working condition, then check out the uh, video that comes with the, the, the actual book on that one. But we're going to jump into playing now. We're going to jump into playing some chords. So we're going to start on page seven and progress through that in lesson one of the chords book. Okay, so here we are on pages 7 through 9, starting on page 7. I'm going to be going through and skipping over most of this information, but what it explains theoretically is that there are individual sounds or pitches, and they each have a name. Seven of them are named um, by letters in the alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. So we have an E pitch, B pitch, G, D, A. For example, those are individual sounds. When we combine more than one together, we start getting some harmony. And if we have three pitches, three different pitches playing at once, or we can even have more than three pitches, we get a chord. And so I'm not going to explain the theory behind all the chords, but it is explained, especially on page 8 and page 9. The important thing that we need to know here in the Guitar 101 course, without going into greater detail, 
like the lessons that come with the books do, is that there are three types of chords and they each have slightly different chord symbols. So there are major chords, sort of sound happy. There are minor chords, sort of sound sad. I hate to assign that to it, but that's sort of the difference. And then there are what we call dominant seventh chords. Major chords with this flatted seventh or bluesy seventh kind of sound. They all have an important function. We're going to see all three types in the songs that we play, and it's going to be important to recognize from the chord symbols the differences between them. So on page nine, you'll see some examples of chord symbols, major chords, minor chords, and dominant seventh chords. I have an example here on the board. Major chords have the name of what we call their root, so the pitch that they're named after. The lowest pitch, the pitch that the chords are built on is the root. So an A chord, it starts on an A pitch. And so we just had the capital letter representing that pitch. When it's a major chord, that's all we see. When it's a minor chord, we're going to see that root note, like the A, followed by a lowercase m or a minus sign, something telling us that it's minor instead of major. As we get going, we're going to see that lowercase m when we're playing a minor chord. And then the dominant seventh chords will have the root and then the number seven following. So we're going to see all three types within the first couple lessons in this book. It's important to know the difference because if we see A minor and we play A major, it's going to sound wrong. So it's important to see the different types of chord symbols. Then there on page 9, you'll see that the chord symbols sit above the written notation. And we'll see that as we get going, and I'll explain it as we get in there. So let's go ahead and flip on over the page. At the bottom of page 9, we get into some rhythm. And it does help to know about rhythm when strumming, but you're going to be mostly learning strumming from my demonstration here. And we're not going to worry about necessarily reading the rhythms at this point. We will be reading rhythms as we get into the notes. So I just kind of want to skip that for now and go into playing some chords. So let's go ahead and flip over to pages 10 and 11. Okay, so page 10 talks a little bit about time signatures. I'm skipping over that as well because it's going to come up when we're working on note reading and we're working on strumming patterns kind of intuitively as I show you how to play them. In this particular lesson, we're just going to be doing all down strumming anyway without any real differences in the rhythm. So if we go over to page 11 then, we're going to talk about chord tablature diagrams. These diagrams are going to be written in the book helping you figure out how to finger the chords. So this is kind of important. I've got one drawn here on the board that matches the one you have there on page 11. I'll just kind of go through it. This diagram matches up to the guitar neck as if it was sitting there just like so. So this would be the nut. We have fret 1 in this space, fret 2, fret 3, and if there were more um, spaces there would be more frets. Then we have the strings. This is the highest string over on the right side and then the second string, third string, fourth, fifth, and sixth. So that's how the strings sort of correlate. Our fingers in our left hand, we assign a number to them. So index finger is number one, middle is two, ring is three, and pinky is four. This only matters because up above we're going to have suggested fingerings. There's more than one way to finger some chords, so you may see more than one example. Some might be written smaller uh, in smaller numbers as an alternate to sort of the one that may be the easiest one to learn at first. But when learning a chord, it can help to start with where's my index finger go, then where's my middle finger go, and then where's my ring finger go. Um, and then the question is, what strings are played open? So the circle means open, meaning they're played without any fingers pressing them down. Or which strings aren't played at all, that's what the X's represent. They mean we're not going to strum those strings when playing the chord. So this is a D chord. We're going to be learning a D chord over on the next page, so we'll just go ahead and work on it. If I look at where my index finger goes first, it's sitting here in the second space. So that's telling me second fret. And it's sitting on one, two, three, the third string, or the third line. So I come to that third string, I put my index finger at the second fret, so one, two, and I'm sitting it just behind that metal fret bar. Then I ask myself, where's my middle finger go, or where's the next finger go, finger two? It's going on the highest string 
at the second fret. So I'm going to add that one at the second fret. I want to position my fingers a little bit behind the middle fret bar, not clear away from them, but just a little bit behind it. Whatever works for getting all my fingers in there. I then ask myself, where's my ring finger go? In this case, it's on the third fret of the second string. So I go ahead and put that there. I'm strumming the open string on the fourth string and not strumming the low two string. So there would be a D chord. Now, um, if there was a pinky, it'd be number four. So if I had four fingers on, I would say number four and I would get to add that one. That's sort of how that diagram works. We're going to flip on over the page and learn some more chords. Okay, so here we are on page 12. We're going to start with the G chord. This one has two different ways to finger it that are shown. The one that is larger and closest to the diagram, that's the most preferred one by most of my students. The alternate fingering I actually use more often myself, but you can use whichever one you prefer. And most of my students prefer to use the one that uses index, middle, and ring instead of middle, ring, and pinky. So, with that one, we're going to first find where our index finger goes. It goes at the second fret on the fifth string. So I'm going to place that just behind that metal fret bar. And then the middle finger goes to the third fret on the low sixth string, and my ring finger goes to the third fret on the very high string. And then all the strings are strummed. So there's no strings that aren't strummed. The ones in between those that we're fingering are strummed open. So we can just strum all six strings. It can help as much as you can to keep your fingers on the tips, but as you're first getting that coordination worked out in your hands, you may find that to be a little bit of a challenge. Now, if you'd rather use the other fingering, then your middle finger goes at the second fret on the fifth string, ring finger goes at the third fret on the sixth string, and pinky goes at the third fret on the top string. So, either way works just fine. I'm going to play it for today the way that probably most of you will choose to finger it. So if we just strum, now we talked about strumming just a few minutes ago, but you're just going to brush the strings with the pick as you're holding the pick, or if you're not using a pick, then you just brush the strings with your thumb. Most of the strumming motion is in the arm, but there's a little bit of play in the wrist, as you can see as I go through. It's, I'm not holding a stiff wrist, I'm not gripping the pick as hard as I can, I've just kind of got it there nice and loose and it's just really uh, fluid as if I was just waving to somebody, only now that same motion is being used as I strum the guitar. I have my fingers, uh, I hold the pick, tucked back in underneath so they're not flailing out. That creates tension through the hand. So I've just got them tucked nicely in sort of a little closed hand position. That's a comfortable position for the hand and then the pick just slips in there. You could do the same thing with your thumb. Just have your fingers nice. If you're using your thumb, have your fingers nice and relaxed. Okay, so we're going to play number one on page 12, which is just strumming down on the strings. The vertical lines divide that music or the staff there with number one and all of them into to equal measurements of time. So they're called measures. Or because there's a line that divides them, sometimes they're referred to as bars, as those are bar lines. You see these diagonal slashes on the music that's showing how many beats are per measure. And so there's four beats per measure. There's a time signature at the start of the song that shows us that. Four, four time. And so there's four beats per measure. We're just going to do four down strums per measure. So a down strum per each of those little slash marks, as we call them, or four down strums per measure. So here we go. And really what we're doing is, as it can be repeated as many times as you want, we're just going to be practicing here strumming on the G chord. So let's go ahead and do that. at different speeds. Alright, we're playing music. We're playing with some chords. The next chord that we need to learn is the E minor. Two different ways shown to finger this one as well. If you're going from fingering the G chord with your index, middle, and ring, then you're going to want to, or the easiest way to finger the E minor 
is keeping your index where it is and then adding your middle finger to the second fret on the fourth string. And the rest of the strings are strummed openly. The alternate option is to go two and three. So middle finger at that second fret on the fifth string, ring finger at that second fret on the fourth string. And that's the way that I usually finger it. Either way is okay. We'll just strum down on that one. As we go to play number two on page 12, we're going to go back and forth between the G chord and the E minor chord. So if you're taking the fingering with index, middle, and ring, and then going to index and middle, I can leave my index finger down as I go back and forth between the two. And you just want to switch back and forth, back and forth, trying to help your memory uh, Getting that locked in your mind of, of those two chords, you just want to get it get it in there, and going back and forth is forcing forcing it into our memory banks. Now you could also be fingering it two and three. There's different reasons that I that I do it, but most of my students prefer to sort of do index and middle at least at first. Sometimes as we as we move far enough in guitar playing, it's nice to have a couple different ways of fingering chords because depending on the song, depending on the situation, one may work better than the other. But when you're first getting started, just find one that, the one that works for you. Alright, so we'll play number two. Basically, we're just going to go back and forth between G and E minor. Four strums per chord. So you go one, two, red, T, and G. on playing these chords and getting used to that switching back and forth, back and forth. And you can go at whatever tempo you need to. Um, the important thing to aim for, at least eventually, is to not pause between. But as you get started, you may find yourself going one, two, three, four, pause, switch, coming back, and going back. And that's okay initially, but eventually what you want to be able to do is keep your right hand going and you can actually hide the change. And so I usually anticipate a little bit as I'm getting to that fourth, I'm thinking, okay, I got to change. So I'm changing at the end there, think about changing. Now I've gotten pretty fast, I've played the guitar thousands and thousands of hours, but when I was first starting, or as I'm working with students who are first starting, it may take a little bit and if you can keep the right hand going, you can sort of hide the fact that you don't have the chord finger just yet. So if I go G, and then I gotta think about switching, and if it takes me a second to get there, if I can keep my right hand going, it sort of hides it, even if it's taking me a second. So that's something to aim for as you're working on learning to play the guitar. As you can get your right hand to keep going and focus on that change in the left hand, you'll get faster. Okay, let's go ahead and we'll work on the next chord we need to learn, which is the C chord. So this one's going to use three fingers, each one in a different fret. It's a little bit more spread out. For some, this one's harder than the others. For some, it's easier. It just kind of depends. We start with our index finger at that first fret, second string. Then we skip over and we have an open third string. Our middle finger goes at the second fret on the fourth string, and our ring finger goes at the third fret on the fifth string. With this one, we are not supposed to strum the sixth string. It won't kill it, but it obscures the meaning of the chord. It kind of muddies it up a little bit. So that one has an X on it there on the diagram. So we're not going to play that one. In this case, we just try and strum, and learn to strum just the top five strings, and gain that kind of control. 
thing I will point out is if your hand comes up and your thumbs over here, um, that's okay. It's not technically maybe the best technique, especially if we're working on like classical guitar or something, but it's more important that you find a good pressure point and that you're not doing something weird with your wrists, some sort of bend. So however you can naturally come to it, and if for you that means pushing from more of this part of the hand, that's okay. I go into that mode a lot when I'm playing these chords down here. And I can still play because my wrist is, is happy. When I need more ability to have room to move, I, I couldn't do that from there. It's too tight on the, on the fingers. But when playing chords and anchoring, it's good and it's better than having some sort of weird weird bend to the wrist as you're going, so I just point that out. Okay, so let's play the C chord here for a moment. Maybe you've got that figured out. Sometimes when I'm in this mode, to help I my thumb, since it's up here, it can just mute that fifth string and it won't ring, so if I overshoot with my right hand, I don't have to worry about it. So here I'm with C, we're just strumming C here for a moment. So we have C, we want to practice going between E minor and C. That'll help us memorize these chords so you can work on switching back and forth. You can hold your middle finger down if you're using the index middle fingering. But that might that might be harder pivoting on that middle finger. So when switching to a chord like this, it can help to plant the index finger first and then add the others. So you, if you can think, where's my index finger go, and then add the others sort of in succession, then you'll be okay. So, C, and then we got the E minor. Going back to E minor, maybe it's not as hard to pivot on that middle finger, or you might be starting over, you're full fingering, and if you are, then again, you're gonna plant that index finger and then find where the others go. So back and forth between C and E minor. talked about this one a few minutes ago when we were learning how to read these tablature diagrams, but the D chord. So with the D chord, this one for some is kind of a trick, especially if you have big hands because the fingers are all tight together. And for others, it's like, great, I don't have to have that big stretch like you do with the C chord. But the index finger is going to go at the second fret on the third string. The middle finger goes at the second fret on the top or the high string, string one. So they're in the same fret and then the ring finger goes on the second string at the third fret. With this one we strum the open fourth string, but we're supposed to not strum the fifth and sixth strings. So you see the X is there. So we're just strumming four strings. If you occasionally get those other ones in there, it just sounds muddy. I'm doing that now. Over time we learn to control and just strum the top four strings. So you can strum that one. Okay, we're going to go from C to D to C to D. So, for this one you have to completely change both times. So think about where I put my index finger, add the others. Plant the index, add the other fingers. Plant the index, add the others. And for you, it might not be this automatic. You might be thinking C, rest, where do I find the D? Okay. Where do I find the C? Okay. And eventually it gets faster. We'll do the little exercise a little bit here, like I've mentioned a couple times. If you want more in-depth practice with me, then you can work with the videos that come with the book. So in, the, in this case, the video that comes with this lesson for the book goes into greater detail, longer practice sessions than we do here in the Guitar 101 class. It's a little more limited to the time, like it is when I'm in the classroom. I only got 45 minutes to an hour. So, we'll, but we'll, so we'll just go ahead and jump into playing D and C. But I'll just remind you that there are other places you can practice more with me if you want to. So here we go, starting on the C. Ready, 
And we got C. Add a D. C. To the D. To the C. To the D. To the C. So forth. Now we got to remember all the way back to the G for number five. We're going to go from D to G to D to G. Here we go. Ready? And we have D. Then the G. We got to plant those fingers. We got the D to the G to the D to the G. So forth. So what we've built up to is the ability to play through number six, which is a progression that's used in a lot of different pop songs so, and, and in various keys. But we're going to play it here with the four chords that we know, and that's G, E minor, C, and D. So G, E minor, C, and D, four strums per chord. One, two, ready, and. So I'm going to change it up a little bit here as we end there on the G. We're going to practice that switching with a little bit faster strumming and then come back to what we were just doing. So we're going to practice G and then switch two, three, four. Give you four beats to switch. Four beats to switch. Four beats to switch. Okay, so here we go. A uh, one, two, ready, go. G. Switch to ready and E minor. Switch to ready and. 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 Switch to ready and 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 one more time switch to ready and Switch it to ready and switch to ready and I switch to ready and we'll just end there on G. Okay, let's go back and we'll do it as written where we don't have any breaks in between. So you got one, two, ready and
so that gets us started with chords. Those are four great chords to learn. They're used in lots of songs. You could look up songs that might have those. Next, uh, in the next lesson, when we do lesson two, we'll learn to do some more involved strumming using those same chords, using other progressions that are used in various pop songs. In the lesson three, when we get to that one, we'll start doing folk songs. For copyright purposes, uh, we won't be doing any pop songs here in the lessons uh, because we can't, but we'll be learning how with folk songs that are in public domain and then I can help point you towards ways you can find songs with those same chords that you can play in similar ways. Pop music is kind of like uh, today's folk music and so there's an overlap in the way they play. But we're getting started on those chords. If you spend just a few minutes every day going through that, you'll start locking those in. With playing guitar, you kind of fight to jump and then you hit the next stair or the next level and you just fight and then you hit there and suddenly you can do it. It's kind of that not gradual every second getting better but just kind of fighting to develop the ability and then you jump to that step. So in this lesson though the next thing we're going to look at is the note reading. So I'll give you a little bit of introduction into playing melodies through reading traditional notation. So that's what we'll do next. We can pull up the note reading book. Okay, so we're working with the note reading now. So we're in the note reading books one and two book. We're on page seven. We're going to start here with just a teeny bit of an introduction into note reading and how it all works. And then we're going to do a little bit of note reading. So reading melodies with standard music notation. So notes are the individual sounds or pitches that we hear. Just one individual sound, whereas the chords have multiple pitches that make that chord. But when we're talking the notes, we're talking about one sound. There's 12 different pitches and they repeat in different ranges, so higher and lower. So here for example is an E pitch that was played in different octaves or different, different ranges. In theory it goes to infinity lower and higher, but of course our ear can only hear so far. Seven of the pitches are considered natural notes and they have letter names. So A, B, C, D, E, F, and G. We're going to work on learning those ones first on the guitar and then we'll work on learning the chromatic pitches. So sharps and flats, ones that sit in between the natural notes that have names like A sharp or B flat, C sharp or D flat. They are named in relation to the natural notes. So we're going to learn the natural notes first. In reading standard music notation, we use something called a staff. So there on page 7 in the middle, you'll see five lines just equally distanced thrown there. That's a staff. Each line and each space on that staff represent a pitch. What helps us know what line and what space represent what pitch is a clef sign. So if you see down below, there's two examples. A treble clef sign and a bass clef sign. On guitar, we almost always read music and when music is actually written for guitar I should say it's written with a treble clef. So we're just going to focus on that one. You can see at the bottom the names of the notes. So the bottom line represents E and then the next space represents F and then the next line represents G. The next space is A. The next line is B. The next space is C. The next line is D. The next space is E. The next line is F. If we went higher and sat on top of the staff, we'd be at a G. You'll notice that as we go higher, we're in alphabetical order. A, B, C, D, E, F, G, and then it starts over again. A, B, C, D, E, F, G. So that's how that works. We're going to be reading notes, shapes drawn on those lines and spaces. Now, the size of the shape, or I should say the type of the shape tells us how long or how many counts we're going to hold that pitch for. So if we go ahead and flip over to page 8, we'll talk about the rhythms or what symbols represent how long we're going to hold each pitch for. Okay, so there at the top of page 8, if you are curious, it does show what notes are represented by the lines and spaces on a staff when there's a bass clef sign. We're just going to move on since we're worrying about reading notes in the treble clef. So the rhythm, you'll see there under the rhythm, so sort of in the middle of the page, an open oval is what's called a whole note, and it's held for four counts. So when we see that drone on the staff, we hold that for four counts. We hold that note for four counts. A half note, same sort of open oval with what we call a stem. It's either vertical line stick, sticking straight up or straight down. It can go either way as we'll see. That's worth half as much as a whole note, so it's a half note. Two counts, so we hold those for two counts. When the note is filled in solid and has a stem, 
it's a quarter note. It's worth one fourth of the whole note, and we hold it for one count. We're going to have measures as we talked about when we were strumming. So we see equal measures, meaning equal lengths of time, are divided and they're shown visually by the bar lines. We will have so many counts per measure. We've been working in our strumming with only having four counts per measure, and that's what we're going to do here initially as we're playing melodies as well. We'll have four counts per measure. And that's shown by the time signature. We see 4-4 four, four time. That top number tells us we have four beats in the measure. The bottom number, the four, represents a quarter note, telling us that we, in essence, have four quarter notes per measure. That's how that works. When we see 3-4 later on, that'll mean we have three. The top number tells us we have three of the bottom, so three quarter notes per measure or three beats per measure since the quarter note gets one count or one beat, generally speaking. If we saw something that said, for example, 2-2, two, two, we'd have two half notes per measure. So the two on the bottom would be would represent the half note. So you, you think like a fraction. So if you add a one and the, and the diagonal line and then you have the two on the bottom, it's one half. So two is representing a half note. So if it was a one on the bottom, one one would be a whole note, right? One over two, one half, one over four, one fourth. So the bottom number, you think sort of fraction like that. The top number tells us how many of those we have. So four quarter notes per measure, and that's what we're going to be working on. And as we encounter time signatures, we'll worry about those when we get to them. So we just need to jump in being ready to read four beats per measure. If we look over on page 9, we get to practice a little bit with a trick known as counting. So if we're counting four beats per measure, the different notes are going to come in at different places along that repetitive one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Equal segments of time or equal increments that each of those beats come across. So for example, when we start there, we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Basically, we're going to pluck the note at the beat that it happens at, and we're going to hold it for its entire length as best we can. Shouldn't be too hard. We'll just go ahead and do it on the top string or the open top string. Everything's written on the B line. We're not worried about what a B note is at the moment. We're just going to play the open top string, which happens to be an E. And if you're using your thumb, then you just pluck with your thumb kind of anchor your fingers on the guitar if you want. If you're using that pick, I sort of anchor my wrist back by the bridge. Not to mute the strings, not on top of them, but if I sit a little bit behind it, that gives me sort of an anchor point, a point to kind of get secure where I am, and all that plucking just comes from the wrist. Okay, so we'll go ahead and play through this little counting exercise. You can count out loud and then we'll play the notes where they come. So here you go, one, two, reti, and we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, Okay, that's a little introduction into to playing the rhythm. When we go over and start playing melodies, we're going to be reading what note we're playing. We're going to have to worry about that and how long we hold that note for. There at the bottom of page 9, it explains tablature diagrams. We were using them with the chords, so I'm not going to re-explain it here. It's the exact same thing, only we're going to have just one note shown on on where to play. So the, the name of the pitch will be above and then it'll show us where to play it and we'll see a recommendation on which finger to use to play that note. Generally speaking, we want to play the notes in the first fret with our index finger, the notes in the second fret with our middle finger, the notes in the third fret with our ring finger, and the notes in the fourth fret with our pinky. Okay, so if you flip on over to page 10, we can get started with playing these notes. So we first need to learn what they are. At the top of the page, you'll see written on the staff 
a pitch. So we see the E pitch written there in the top space of the staff. And then the diagram above shows us that that E note, that top space, is played as the open top string on the guitar. So the open E string. And you can just pluck that a few times. If yours sounds like mine, then you know you're playing the right note. Okay, so on to the F note then. That one's at the first fret of the top string. It sits on the top line of the staff. So that's where our F is. I'm going to use my index finger since I'm in the first fret, and I'm going to try and play it on the tip. Put my index finger a couple millimeters behind the metal fret bar. If I move it back too far, it's harder to get a good tone. So when I get it just up behind the metal fret bar, not on it, but just behind it, I can get the best tone. And I'm on that tip. I'm using my thumb behind around the second fret to get some leverage and just push down against that. So that's the F pitch, top line on the staff, first fret on the high string. Then we got the G that sits on top of the staff. And that one's at the third fret. And I'm going to use the ring finger. So you, I recommend you use your ring finger. Same thing. I'm going to try and play it on the tip. I'm going to set it just a couple millimeters behind the metal fret bar at the third fret. So we have E, F, and G. And we'll go ahead and play number one there on page 10. Number one has all whole notes. So we don't have to worry about really how long the different pitches are going to last because they're all going to last four counts. Here we go. One, two, red, T, and we have E, two, three, four, F, two, three, four, G, two, three, four, F, two, three, four, E, two, three, four, G, two, three, four, F, two, three, four, E, two, three, four, off. And it's really important as you're doing this that you keep using open string has no fingers, first fret, first finger, so the index finger, third fret, third finger, or the ring finger. You want to keep that happening as you do, you learn this stuff a little bit faster. Let's go ahead and play number two. So you got one, two, red, D, and we have E, two, E, two, F, two, F, two, G, two, G, two, F, two, E, two, F, two, G, two, F, two, E, two, G, two, E, two, E, two, three, four, off. Okay, we'll go on over to page 11 and do number three. So number three has all quarter notes except for the very last one. So we get to practice these notes with quarter notes now. One, two, red, D, and. Then we got F. Then we got G. A great practice is to say aloud the names of the notes while playing the notes. That helps lock it in to the memorization that we're working on. So this is kind of a left-brained activity at this point. Just trying to memorize where those notes are and work out sort of what we call muscle memory, the layman's term, on getting the system to work through our nerves, to tell our muscles what to do as we play these notes. So we're going to go ahead and do it again, but with me, say the names of the notes out loud. So you got one... Two, red, T, and E, 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 F, 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 G, 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 F, F, E, 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 F, G, F, E, E, G, G, F, E, F, G, two, three, four, off. Okay, we'll do number four. This one's going to change up the notes a lot more. So one, two, red, D, 
T and E F G F E E G G F E F E G F G F E F G Okay, we'll do number five. This one's going to change up the rhythm as well as having the pitches change up. So, E string pearls. There's not a lot of familiar melodies, if any, that only use three notes. As soon as we start getting into more notes, we'll have familiar melodies. As it is right now, you get to play with my creativity on limited rhythms and limited notes, but hopefully it's kind of fun. It's kind of like Guitar Hero. You get to play along with me, not to say that I'm your guitar hero, but I should be, no. The, uh, you get to play right along with me and you just get as many as you can and you work on it, work on it on your own, come back, try and get as many as you can again pretty soon. You've got it as good as I've got it. So here we go. Number five. One, two, red T, and we have E, two, three, four, G, two, F, two, Two G F E two G two F two G F E two F E G two F E F G F E two three four F G Okay, so there's a little bit of introduction on reading standard music notation. We'll work on that just a little bit. Each class of this Guitar 101 as well. The other thing that we're going to introduce today is how to read tablature notation. So we'll go ahead and grab the tablature book and start doing some tablature. Okay, so we're on to the tablature now. We're going to be on page 7 in the tablature book. I've got that indicated there on the board. Now with the tablature book today and in most of the Guitar 101 course and the note reading book and even the chords, there isn't time to go into great detail on any of these songs or exercises. This course is designed just like the ones where I meet with students once or twice a week and we work on some stuff together. They work on some stuff on their own. But each of the books has in-depth lessons that go through each of the songs and exercises in great detail. There's explanations about the theory and the different aspects of the music that go into a lot greater detail. So if you want more detail than what you get here, you just use those video lessons that are shown. You have the addresses and QR codes at the beginning of the books that show you for each of the lessons and each part of the lesson. There's timestamps that show you where you can jump to in those videos to find help or to get to play along with me more than what happens here in this course. So that's going to be the case for tablature right now as it was for the introduction into the note reading. You can do that and even in the chords if you want more practice there or if you ever just get antsy and want to go ahead then you can do that as well. Okay, so tablature, page 7. Tablature is a type of notation that's specific to the guitar. The guitar is sort of a complex instrument to learn to read notes on and that's for a couple reasons. One, we've got these six strings, we've got all these frets, and the pitches seem sort of random. When we look at written notation in relation to the piano, there's a pattern to the keys of the piano, so it becomes obvious where the C notes are, where the A notes are, where the E notes are, and so forth. But on the guitar, we have to sort of memorize it. The other thing that makes it hard is that there are repeats of notes. So for example, this top E string happens again at the fifth fret on the second string, again at the ninth, 14th and so on and if I cheat with a harmonic I can get it on all six strings that same exact note so you have to sort of pick now as we're working on written notation we're gonna stay down in an area where that overlap only happens once and so we're able to ignore it and that's really helpful but what tablature did and this was the first way that they started writing music really for guitar and instruments like the vihuela or the lute instruments that the guitar grew out of, so it's parents, so to speak, and grandparents, is that 
all you'd need is a line to represent each string and then with numbers you could tell what fret it goes at. So there on page 7, right in the middle you see tab running vertically but we have six lines instead of five. So tablature staff has six lines. Each of the lines represent a string on the guitar. The highest line is the highest sounding string. The lowest line is the lowest sounding string. So that high string, the top, the top line, is string one or the highest string, the E string. The next line down is the B or second string. Then you get the G or the third string, D or the fourth string, A or the fifth string, and then E or the sixth string. So we have six strings. And then the numbers are gonna tell us what fret. So if we're on that high string or written on the high line, we see zero, that would mean that we play that string open or without any frets. If we see a number one, we play the first fret. Number two, second fret. Number three, third fret, number four, fourth fret, number five, fifth fret, sixth, seventh, eighth, and so on. We're going to stay within the first four frets for quite a while as we're working on reading melodies and playing melodies with tablature. So you'll see there as an example for each of the lines and sort of measures apart, each one's in its own measure, O, one, two, three, four, and then to the next space. And this is a great warm-up exercise as you get your fingers working and as you're starting to learn to play the guitar. This is a great thing to do, just what's written here, and we're going to do it together. The thing I want to point out before we do, though, is ideally, just like with the notes, you want to play the, the ones that are in the first fret with your index finger, the ones in the second with your middle, the ones in the third with your ring finger, and the ones in the fourth with your pinky. So let's go ahead and do this and try really hard to make all four fingers work as an exercise, as a warm-up, as a finger development thing. It's really crucial that we make all four of those fingers start working. That's going to make learning to play the guitar and our ability to play the guitar grow and go that much faster. So let's play that there right in the middle of the page. We go red C and we got the open first fret, second, third, fourth, then the second string. Making sure to use middle, ring, pinky, then the third string. Then the fourth string. string, the sixth string, and that's all there is to it. Now, we can do that again. We're going to do it just a little bit faster, but you could pause the video or use that as a warm-up every time you go to play the guitar. It'll start developing the muscles in your hand. We'll do it again just a little bit faster. Uh, one, two, red, Go. Okay. At the bottom of page seven, you see a couple examples of sort of published and non published. No, uh, tablature. You're going to see different variations out there. We're going to work in the book with notation that's similar to the one on the left. This is sort of the standard public published version where you have the actual written notation, the standard universal notation up above, and then the tablature below showing us how to play it. Over on the right side there at the bottom of page seven, you see sort of six lines with the little dashes and then tablature thrown in. Both examples are exemplifying the same thing. Open, 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 open. There's a lot of music out on the internet that's available, even free, that you'll find where somebody has written in tablature how to play something. It's sort of a crude tablature, usually using a word processing program and using dashes to make the six lines and then the numbers in there to show. And so just making you aware of that is what's happening here at the bottom of page seven. We're going to be reading the published version. So the type on the left will have the standard music notation up above with the tab tablature below. The numbers will be all that we'll really see. Any rhythms that we're going to be playing will be written in the actual music notation above. We're going to be using tablature in a real intuitive sort of fashion.
If you flip to page 8 in the book, there's some explanation on rhythms. With the tablature, we're not going to worry about rhythm like we are when we're counting and playing the standard music notation. We're going to worry about that there. Here with the tablature, we're going to learn to play songs intuitively. We're going to learn to play them by ear. So, and then using the numbers to help our fingers at start to figure out how to play it. And that's how we're going to work. The tablature is going to be an aid to us learning to play melodies by ear. Most of the melodies might be familiar to you and that's helpful as you go through and do it. You, if not, you've got me and you can learn them by listening to me play it and then you try and play it. And that's how we're going to work through the tablature a little bit more intuitively, which is a little bit more right brain type of learning. So we're getting both the left and the right brain learning actually in there which is going to help our guitar playing grow that much faster. So we're going to skip over page 8, we'll go on to page 9 and actually start reading and playing with some tablature. Okay, so on page 9 we're going to do number 1. This one's set up as sort of an orientation exercise. As you look across the whole thing, they're all quarter notes. Every note is a quarter note except the very last one, which is a half note. So we don't have to worry about rhythms. We're just going to worry about putting our fingers in the right places as we're playing the tablature and using the correct fingerings. So, as we know, index goes in the first fret, middle in the second, ring in the third, and pinky in the fourth. With this one, we're going to stay on the top two strings. We'll just get used to reading notes and sort of orienting ourselves to finding how we play something with, with reading tablature. So we'll go ahead and do it. We've actually played a lot of these notes with notation today, so you could read the standard music notation at least when the notes are E, F, and G. We're going to work on tablature here, though, so we don't have to worry about those. We'll just go ahead and read the tablature. It starts with the open top string. Since everything is a quarter note, you can just focus on reading more than actually having to worry about what it sounds like. But I will play it accurately, so if you're off, you'll know something's not quite right in how you're going about it, or your hands got moved, or whatnot. So, here we go. One, two, reti, and we have open, 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 and first fret. We got the open. Third. First. Open. Third. First. Third. Then open. Going on to the second string. First fret. back and forth between the strings. Okay, now I'm going to go on to the next page. We'll do pages 10 and 11 and work on some other exercises. You can play that one as many times as you need to to get comfortable with the tablature. I'm just introducing this to you today. And as I've mentioned, the videos that come with the book exclusively go into greater detail, practice at different tempos. But I'm going to go ahead and flip over to page 10 and 11 now, do a couple more exercises and a couple familiar songs. Okay, so we'll do number two. You'll notice as you glance over it that there's a couple places where the rhythm breaks up from being constant quarter notes. So like in the fourth measure, we have a whole note, so we're going to hold that pitch for four counts. And then at the beginning of the second line, there's two half notes, so we'll hold each of those for two counts. And then the final note uh, is a whole note again, and it gets four counts. Otherwise, we got all quarter notes. We're going to use a little bit more with our middle and pinky, so the fingers will get a little, little bit more involved than what we had in the last one, but it's good for us and it should be kind of fun. So here we go. One, two, ready, go.
three, four. Oh. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the next one, so number three. You can practice number two as many times as you need to and want to, but here in this lesson, I'm gonna go on to number three. This one has a little bit of change with rhythm, so you're gonna kinda have to just watch. You'll see when there's two notes per measure that they're each worth two counts, or they're each half notes. When there's one, it's worth four counts, so it's the whole note. And when there's four, we've got the quarter notes happening. So this one is also going to add the third string. So, so far we've been working on the top two strings. Now we've got to read a little bit with that third string in there as well and jump back and forth. So when plucking individual notes, I mentioned this with the note reading, but I usually with, with the pick will anchor back on the bridge a little bit and that just kind of helps me orient myself and start gaining control on plucking the string I'm going for plucking. You can do that a little bit with your fingers if you're using your thumb. Okay, so here we go. One, two, ready, go. We got open. And we're off. Okay, we'll go over to page 11. We're gonna do numbers four and five. We actually get into some melodies now. It's way more fun when we're using this to learn melodies, especially when they're recognizable, or if they're not yet recognizable, that we can listen to them and start to pick up what they sound like. And they're great, they're great melodies. So we're gonna start with my favorite children's song ever, which is Twinkle Twinkle Little Star, number four. This one is hopefully intuitive. So we're gonna play the rhythms intuitively. I'm going to match how it's written here in the book, but if you play it with a slightly different rhythm from how you've sung it or known it before, that's okay. When we're playing tablature, in this case, where we're just trying to learn a little bit more intuitively, a little bit more with the right brain, in addition to that technique development of the left brain, then it's, it's totally okay to do it the way you've heard it before or know it, um, and let the tablature guide your fingers in finding those sounds that are familiar to you. So we'll go ahead with Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. Remember as we're doing these, it's really important not to move around your fingers and use one or two fingers to play these melodies, but to really sort of force yourself from the beginning to start establishing that you do index in the first fret, middle in the second, ring in the, in the third, and pinky in the fourth. If you do that, you'll learn so much quicker, gain that much more control, and eventually be able to play more things way easier. Here we go. One, two, ready, and... Okay, I love that melody. I'm gonna do one more here in this lesson as we're getting introduced into tablature. If you wanna go for farther, you can. In the next lesson, we'll build on these again and go further, but we're gonna do today when the saints go marching in, in addition to Twinkle Twinkle. So number five. Red 
and go. Okay, so that gets us into tablature. Tablature is fun. It helps us play melodies and learn intuitively things that we want to learn that maybe we can't read notes or, or that we don't know enough about the guitar yet to be able to play. So it's a nice window into that, and it's really cool. Here today, first lesson on the guitar, already playing a couple melodies. Okay, so that wraps us up in this first Guitar 101 lesson or class. I hope you're having fun as you're getting started learning to play the guitar, playing some chords, reading some notes, and playing some melodies with tablature. So this is off to a great start. Just keep playing a little bit a day. Just have fun with it. In the next lesson, we'll work on building on what we've learned so far. So strumming some new strumming patterns with the chords, playing some new progressions that are played in pop music. We'll also... Keep working on a little bit of that note reading and reading some more melodies, learning some more melodies with the tablature, just developing our hands and hopefully having fun playing the guitar while we're doing it. I love playing the guitar. It's well worth it. Just stick it out. Keep having fun. And eventually you'll be playing songs that you just love and having a blast doing it. So we'll see you in lesson two. If you found this video helpful, please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. For more in-depth lessons and to progress through a free guitar course, check out my Guitar 101 series on YouTube and my Guitar Method books, which all come with access to hours of in-depth video lessons. You can find more information about me and my products at kristenbromley.com. Take care.